We are in for a treat today. We are gonna get started with the best-selling author of Grain Brain, who, by the way, we have breaking news at Revitalize this morning. As of this morning, Dr. Perlmutter is a celebrity doctor, according to Wikipedia. <laughs> so he's got a new book out. Come on up, Dr. Perlmutter. So how does it feel being a celebrity this morning? I, I'm taking it all in. <laughs> it's really great. Great to be here. So a lot's happened since uh, you first published Grain Brain. So I'm guessing, so you still don't like gluten, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> gluten and carbs and sugar. I mean, who knew that we shouldn't be eating sugar, shouldn't be eating carbs? Mm -hmm. And how incredible it was that there was just this, this beautiful validation just this past week announced in the New York Times that it turns out that the, this dietary recommendation that we should eat a lot of carbs and sugar only for the past 30 years was finally, uh, we realized what was going on behind that. So, great. So what has changed? Talk to me about what else has changed, you know, with the research. Well, I think the big, the big news here, and I know that uh, many of you are, are deeply interested in this, and that is the fundamental role of the gut bacteria, the microbiome mm -hmm. in terms of making our neurotransmitters, making vitamins, regulating inflammation within our bodies the cornerstone of really every chronic degenerative condition that we suffer and, and even aging. So that is really uh, what's revolutionary, that we recognize that to be resilient and to be robust, we have to embrace diversity within the gut bacteria. We have to live our lives in such a way that we don't compromise this diversity, this God-given diversity of the bugs that live within us. And, you know, if I could just for a moment talk about that notion uh, maybe in a, in, a, in a broader way, because, um, you know, as we talk about, we lecture about the importance of having all kinds of good bacteria within the gut, I think the broader notion is that, you know, diversity allows resilience, and even in our day-to-day -day lives, we are seeing uh, forces at work that are kind of arguing that we should not uh, embrace diversity amongst people, yep. and uh, I think that's to our detriment, that we've got to you know, embrace the notion that people have different ideas about things. And as we do that as a culture, it makes us more resilient. So where does gluten fit in the diversity? <laughs> so gluten, I'm, uh, in terms of current sciences, we yep. have our talk today. Yep. I'm not going to say that it represents a significant threat to the microbiome, but when you look at recent work from Harvard, what we do see that a protein found in gluten called gliadin actually leads to, I'm going to get a little technical here, but stay with me. You guys are up for it. Uh, we're all uh, coffeeed up. Uh, leads to increased gut permeability. Yep. Uh, and it happens not just in the 1% of those of us who have celiac disease or the 30% who may have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but what the Harvard researchers published last year was that 100% of humans increase their gut leakiness when they are exposed to gliadin, a protein found in gluten. Why is that an issue? It's an issue because when your gut is permeable, that is what instigates inflammation yep. from top to bottom, or as we used to say in medicine, from anus to ulna, everywhere in your body. That's, in I, that's a good sound bite. I know. <laughs> good. You heard it from first. From anus here. to ulna. You, can we get that on the, cl on the clip? Yeah. Social media, Twitter? It's going to be from boop to all But it was a medical term. We're allowed, right? Oh, yeah. We're, this isn't the Today Show here, so. Uh, so what ha why is inflammation so terrible? Inflammation sets into uh, process a cascade of events that ultimately leads to the activation of damaging chemicals called free radicals. So if you want to increase the damage to your cells, to your uh, body fat, to even your DNA, you open the door for inflammation. You change your diet in such a way that you're eating more sugar, eating less fiber, you're taking the antibiotics, you're taking the proton pump inhibiting drugs that yep. change your microbiome. And that's what leads to gut permeability. And it's really very, very straightforward. And, you know, five years ago, we didn't know this as much. In fact, more than about 90% of all the literature dealing with the microbiome and this notion of inflammation mm -hmm. has only been published just in the past five years. So why didn't you know about this 10 years ago or when I was in medical school? You know, back when I was in medical school, when our textbooks were written on papyrus, we didn't, uh, we didn't know that brain cells could regenerate. Right. With that whole notion of neurogenesis, growing new brain cells, 
was completely, no one ever talked about it because it didn't exist in humans, and now we embrace that. Back then, we were fun, uh, fun, uh, functioning on what's called the germ theory, that all germs are bad. Well, almost all germs, Jason, in your body are here to help you, and they surround you. You know, it's not just the microbiome in your gut, but surrounding you is a three-foot cloud of bacteria. That like, makes me like feel pig great. Pen. Thank you. But, but think about this. You're trying to tell me something, doctor? <laughs> All of us, think about this, the person sitting next to you, we are communicating information by breathing in the microbiomes of people sitting near us or, or in, when we're in close contact with people. That's a good thing. Why? Because it's giving you information. That's how we have to look at the microbiome now, as, as giving us information. That's why when a baby is born and passes through the vaginal birth canal, that process is transmitting information to that baby. So you're making so gluten equals gut permeability equals inflammation. inflammation and Simple that enough. That is connected to every disease. That's we connected do not want. to Alzheimer's. It's connected to coronary artery disease, diabetes, cancer, skin inflammation, joint inflammation. All begins at the level of the gut, at the one cell layer of the gut that mediates that that separates the inside of your gut from the rest of your body. We've got to do everything we can to preserve that one small layer called epithelium. So what do you say to people who live by the 80-20 rule? You know, 80% no gluten, 20% gluten, is that? It's, uh, I, ha I say halfway measures work halfway. Uh, it isn't the real amount of gluten that you consume. It's pretty much an all or none process. And, Even you know, sourdough? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, look upon it as uh, straws on a camel's back. And, you know, each of these things ultimately weighs, look, some of the water that you drink has chlorine in it. Uh, some people do have to take an antibiotic once in a while if you have a bacterial infection. People are taking other drugs. All of these things are playing on your gut. They're adding up uh, as straws do on the camel's back, and ultimately it breaks and you come down with a disease. Why did I get MS? Why do I have coronary artery disease? It's no mystery. It's not because you're deficient in a statin drug. It's because you've increased inflammation in your body. So I'm going to move on to sugar. Good, bad? We're moving on to sugar. Let's move off sugar. I did, a, uh, I did a Facebook Live the other day, and as the questions were coming in, it was, what about honey? What about uh, sure. maple syrup? And, you know, I don't care, with all due respect, if your honey is made by bees that live on an ashram that <laughs> meditate twice a day. It doesn't matter. It's sugar got to get over it. you got to get over it. And the less you give in to that, the less you're going to really want to be eating sugar day in and day out. It's sugar. We've never, when I say never, I don't mean in the last 10,000 years. I mean, in 2.4 million years, we didn't have sugar. The only time we had sweet was in the late summer and the early fall. Why? The fruit on the ground, the blueberries would ripen. ripen. We would eat that because we all have a sweet tooth. That triggered insulin yeah. production. We made body fat, and we survived through the winter. It's a great mechanism, but now people are storing body fat for the winter that never comes based upon the mechanism <laughs> of eating carbs. It's not the fat. That was the big argument in Grain Brain. Eat fat, and you'd be healthy. So We've your, always eaten fat. In your, so we're going to touch on fat and carbs, so I'll start with fat uh, and, and also the connection between fat and brain health. What is the connection? Well, we get back to, well, there are many, many levels. First of all, fat as a fuel source is highly efficient. Uh, as we know, the more ketotic, this crowd knows ketos ketosis, I don't have to explain, but the more our bodies burn fat as a fuel source, uh, the more efficiently we're utilizing that fuel, and more importantly, the less damaging free radicals are created. You know, in the day we were told, oh, your brain needs glucose, that's why we should eat candy bars. Your brain is powered with glucose. Nothing is further from the truth. Your brain will thrive when you power it with fat. And importantly, the only way that's going to happen is when you add in dietary fat, you eat the coconut oil, uh, you drink the coffee that has, uh, that's enriched with things to make you more ketotic. Uh, that said, you've got to cut the sugar and the carbs or your body will preferentially choose to burn carbs. So the brain loves to, to consume fat as an energy source, as does every other cell in your body. And beyond that, your brain is 70% yeah. fat, not just yours. And you're not, uh, I'm not calling you a fathead you. here, but <laughs> it's a, your brain needs fat to build neurons, to make neurons. The membranes of your cells that allow one cell to communicate with the next cell are made of fat. Fat is your friend. It's a wonderful wor word. You know, if you walk up to somebody in the street and just say that one word, fat, 
you know, they're not going to be real happy about that because we have this connotation that fat means obesity, means body fat uh, and visceral fat. Those are bad things, of course. But dietary fat is something that has allowed us to survive uh, 2.4 million years and to get to this point today to have this conversation. What are your favorite healthy fats? Coconut oil, nuts and seeds, grass-fed beef, uh, grass-fed bacon that I have this morning, thanks to you. Eggs. Eggs. Remember the day, you guys are too young, but there used to be a time in ancient history where we were, were on the menu of the, at the restaurant, they would say, egg white omelet. I, I, and I wrote about that. I used a hashtag for what, why that's fantastic, WTF. Why that's fantastic. <laughs> why, why do you want to eat, why do you want to get rid of the yolk? That's where the most important nutrients are located, like cholesterol. Did I just say dietary cholesterol? You darn right I did. Your brain needs cholesterol. So uh, it, it's not like we're, we're turning these notions 180 degrees. Right. We're going back to where we've always been, recognizing that our 23,000 gene genome has been cultivated for millions of years to respond to environmental uh, issues around us, most importantly dietary, and it's only been the last 30 years or so that we've been told, give up on the fat and eat uh, more carbs. And that's a diet that's unlike anything we've ever eaten. So how come you left avocados off the list? Hey, I didn't. I walked down the sidewalk this morning okay. and it said, eat avocados. And I even had the security guy in the pl uh, coming in the airport, looked in my bag. He said, what's this? It's an avocado because I travel with them. I have three avocados. One's really hard, one's medium, and one is soft. So... so. <laughs> And hard-boiled eggs, too, I might add. So what else is hurting brain health? The other really important factor, if they're bullet points, and maybe there'll be three, here's number two, is aerobic exercise. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Turns out that as a gene expression modifier, in other words, changing your gene expression, who knew, you can change your life code, aerobic exercise causes your genome to make a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which is growth hormone for your brain. You can grow new brain cells, and uh, as opposed to having a shrinking hip hippocampus, your brain's memory center, why did I point to myself? I forgot. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to your brain's memory center, size matters. You know, you, ever, you can argue size doesn't matter in other venues. That's not why we're here today. But you can increase the size, which is what you not necessarily can do in other venues, but you can increase the size of your hippocampus by aerobically exercising. It's been proven at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Kirk Erickson has published some amazing studies on humans after two years of aerobic... They, didn't, they took a break. They didn't exercise for two years. 20 minutes a day, seven days a week, your hippocampus grows. You improve memory function. There's no pharmaceutical that will do that for you. So what's that optimal 20 minutes? Is it walking, running, yoga, spinning? What is it? It looks like it's aerobic. Okay. Uh, I would say you want to reach a good target heart rate. Uh, obviously, it depends on the person. I prefer to tell people, as a very crude estimate, mm -hmm. uh, 180 minus your age. Okay. So for me, I'm going to be 81. Uh, that's, uh, well, in 20 years. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's 180 minus your age. Now, if you're on medication, if you're not in shape or you're in terrific shape, those numbers are variable. Talk to me about stress, brain health. So stress and brain health, very important thing to realize. You know, when you're stressed chronically or you experience an acute stress, which is severe, what is the chemical that your body makes? The stress hormone, which is cortisol. And uh, cortisol is directly toxic to your brain cells that live in the hippocampus. It kills off your memory brain cells. Now, uh, as we look at the brain through the lens of the microbiome, we realize that this chemical cortisol increases gut permeability as well, and also changes the array, the diversity of the bacteria and other organisms that live within the gut. So we're just beginning to understand this beautiful dance that happens mm -hmm. between the health of the gut and the health of the brain. And I'm going to say that amongst uh, my neurology co uh, uh, colleagues, that's, it's a bit difficult to grasp that there's something going on south of the foramen magnum that has a very important role to play in the function of the brain. And you know what I'm saying, and I, as I've been saying in books like Grain Brain, is that we've got to look at the gut and that when we pay attention to that, we can now explain how you can prevent Alzheimer's disease a disease for right. which there is no treatment. 
So where do you think we're going to be in a year from now? Back here at, at this venue, years. eating yes. avocados. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully, if I get the invite. You, you, you'll, you'll be back. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll be back. In terms of in developing science, we talk about diseases like Alzheimer's, and neurolog neurological diseases. Like, where do you think, if there's no cure today, where do you think we're going to be in three to five years? It's my hope that, you know, those of us who are lighting the single candle and are not cursing the darkness, that our voices will be heard mm -hmm. in venues like this that people are paying attention to. You know, we're now really fully understanding the uh, traction that social media is getting with the, the people who are willing to listen. And we live in a world where we are told, live your life come what may, and when you're suddenly one taco short of a combo platter mentally, there'll be a drug for you. We don't have that drug, and we're decades away from it. You guys are just getting that? <laughs> That's a circle joke. You laugh and get around to it. So uh, we are just, uh, we're decades away from a miracle Alzheimer's cure, and yet the wonderful peer-reviewed data is showing us there is a powerful relationship, for example, between becoming a type 2 diabetic and quadrupling your risk for a disease, Alzheimer's, that has no treatment. Don't become diabetic. How do you do that? Don't eat sugar. Don't eat carbs or limit them dramatically. Eat more fat, and really very important other message is you've got to eat more dietary fiber, more prebiotic fiber to yep. nurture these good bacteria and enhance diversity of the bacteria. So for everyone here, everyone watching, they're saying, all right, I'm sold, I want to live to 81 or 100 or what have you, have, be, be really sharp, be healthy. What's your recipe for optimal brain health? I would say number one is embrace the notion of gratitude in your life. You weren't expecting that. But uh, do I have a peer-reviewed reference I can quote to you right now? No, I can't. So it's You're just me. You're a celebrity doctor. Come on. It's me from my heart uh, explaining that. I think the most healing experience we have in our lives is gratitude. And yep. Compassion and forgiveness are on that list as well. Now, from the nuts and bolts day-to-day -day activity, I'd say that sugar elimination, carb elimination, getting back uh, a lot of fiber and healthful fat into your diet is fundamental and aerobic exercise. These are the keys. And you can't, these are not, uh, you can't commercialize them. You're not going to be able, they're not proprietary. You need to buy a pair of sneakers. That was a word that your parents used in the day to talk about exercise shoes. But anyway, uh, but it's very simple. And it's getting, giving the human body back those, what we call epigenetic signals, meaning signaling our DNA, those epigenetic signals that we have responded to in an appropriate way uh, for a couple of million years. And that's what's going to keep our bodies healthy and our brains healthy. There's nothing special about a, a, a brain smart lifestyle program that's any different from a heart smart dietary program and lifestyle program that is any different from a program that's designed to reduce your risk of cancer or diabetes for that matter. So the final question, I don't think, I don't think a lot of people know your lovely wife, Lise, who's also here, is also a healer, but, but not the MD kind. Do you want to talk a little bit about what she does and how she compliments you, which a lot of people probably don't know? I'd say that, uh, it, it, just to take a step back, um, th the type of medicine that's generally practiced in Western cultures is at most a 15-minute interface that ends with the coin of medical commerce, which is a prescription written, mm -hmm. the long-term consequences of which are, uh, are not known. And for, you know, truthfully, that's what my training was as a neurologist. And uh, through the work uh, that my wife does, uh, I've learned that there's a lot of stuff going on out there that is powerful, that relates to our physiologies and who we are on this planet in a way that's much deeper than uh, mainstream medicine cares to embrace. It's, uh, it's very, very myopic for us to think that we have the answers. And, you know, these days as we run up against people who dig in their heels that this is the way we treat all infections with antibiotics, even if they're viral, and to not avail ourselves of the kind of work that my wife does, for example, to acupuncture, to uh, a whole host of other healing modalities, um, is, um, is really selling short the, yeah. the beautiful symphony that happens in our bodies that creates health. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Dr. Thank Perlmutter. Thank you. Thank you. You're great.